I have a lot of starting off points this morning. <laughs> Pick one. Uh, I'm going to start with hope. <clears throat> the word hope is really a powerful part of spiritual practice. There are wonderful things about hope, and there are problematic things about hope. I'll tell you the wonderful thing about hope. It's the uh, experience of it, the biological, emotional, <laughs> physiological, spiritual dynamic of this open-hearted embrace of possibility, of change, of directionality, of attainment. There's so much invested in the experience of hope, and it lifts us up. It's an uprising energy. It is a gift to anyone who experiences it. And somehow, if ever there was a time where the experience of hope was really essential, it's been in recent times in, let's say, the American culture, like probably the world culture, probably always in, in every way for every human being since time immemorial. But this week was a dramatic example of hope at work. So forgive me for being particular and even political, but um, the change that took place since last Sunday in the American culture was extraordinary and phenomenal on every level. But I guess I can mostly talk about it from my own personal sense of having had months and months of concern and despair and feeling that the universe was writing a script that I didn't want to read or a movie I didn't want to go see. And, uh, and then it changed the plot point. Mm -hmm. It turned it around and in ways that were surprising and noble and uplifting and wonderful in terms of storytelling. And I will go specifically into a president who is basically my age and who had to look at the world through the eyes of his own personal need and wants and desires and the world beyond that. And he had to make a choice and a decision about what do I serve? Do I serve my sense of being the most important and essential ingredient in making the world a better place? Or do I trust the world to operate without my leadership? That's not easy. It's not easy to do. And I have to say, the heroic and noble element of that will be part of the history of this country, part of our collective journey, watching somebody selfless at the top of the sort of leadership role give themselves over to something else for reasons that were personal, hard, and maybe even ones he didn't want to do. Probably that's the case. <laughs> but he handed his his future over to something greater. It's a great example to all of us because we're all going to have opportunities to, maybe not at that level, but at times think of others before we think of ourselves. And to make that kind of noble choice, just to have an example like that lying in front of us is so extraordinary. And uh, and I'm told, that, you know, because you read everything now, I do, you know, George Washington did the same thing. He was very grateful not to have children because he wasn't going to pass on this country to his offspring, but it was going to go to a collective choice. And that's really, really beautiful. And so we are now back on the road to collectivity choosing, putting a voice out there, engaging the world in a way that is hopeful, meaning things can happen that were perhaps not expected in the larger scheme of things, and to invest in that experience of upliftment. And I think that's the key word. Why is hope uplifting? Why does it go into something higher? I'll let you answer that for yourself, but that is the experience. It is a light energy that goes up in the same way that spiritual energy is uplifting. It carries you above and beyond, beyond the horizontal into the upper reaches of the vertical. And uh, it also goes deep. So it descends into the 
the bowels of your being, if you will, and you get to experience something like gratitude and possibility and the openness of the unknown and not the fear of the unknown, but the fact that it could be anything. And the story writer, the narrator, the narrator of this incredible journey has got us in his thrall or her thrall or its thrall. This is an amazing ride we are all on right at this juncture in our history of worldly being. And we are worldly beings. We're here in this collective journey. And, you know, you can look at the uh, the sense of our nation, and there are people on both sides and fairly balanced. And that's a kind of interesting dynamic. And it's confusing on some level because one would like to think everybody shares the same enlightened views of the world or the same particular view of the world. But no, we're all different and we all have our own collective engagement and our own specific engagement in outcome and what happens in life. But hope is extraordinary, and in the old terminology, it springs eternal, which is something I did not know, really. I heard the line forever, but watching it spring out of nowhere, it was like, for me, wow. And, I, you know, I love narrative and storytelling and authorship, and I love when the uh, storyteller does that to you. It's like, oh, my God, it's not going to be what we thought. It could be different. It could be a, something else altogether. The world may be in a better place than we expected. Of course, I'm talking from a particular political slant and not everybody will agree with me in the exactitude of what I'm saying, but there is something happening right now and light is filtering through in a very big and very collective way. And we are part of that light and we can shed that light and we can engage that light in any way that you can figure out what engagement means, but support of hope support of upliftment. It's extraordinary, and it's incredibly uh, uplifting. The downside, of course, and this is just projection, hope squashed, <laughs> you know, hope that doesn't fulfill itself. That happens in every screenplay I've ever seen, and in every movie and every story, hope gets quashed, then it sometimes rises again. There's so many variables, but the problem of investing in hope, and for a reason that many people don't invest in hope, is that they don't want the pain of it going away. They don't want the disappointment. But this is where engagement comes in, because real life, real life is filled with the potential for upliftment and the potential for falling off the cliff. It's just there. This is the dynamic of being a human being. And being a human being lifts you up and drops you off, and you are the entirety of that process. <clears throat> the idea that hope springs eternal may be the great lasting belief that we have in the finalities of our life, that it will come back, it will return, that, it will, that we will be ultimately lifted up into the light and the joy of being. I, for one, believe that I, I, deeply, more than deeply. It's kind of give me know it. But in the drama of the human journey, we have to be prepared to engage hope. And also when it falls away, if it does fall away, I'm not trying to project that, but if it does fall away, to find our bearings, to find ourselves, to find how we can navigate a world that has hopelessness in it for the time being, or let's say no, no hope, what do you do? And, and I reference this fairly often, but I was born, Blanche was born, many of us, were not, well, not everybody's different, but we were born in the middle of a world war raging around the planet, planet and we were, America was losing the war, Europe, the, 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 the forces of good were losing the war, and it was hopeless, and yet our parents, for whatever reason, brought us into that world, and we were born into a world where the war was one, if you will, by forces of light and good. We lived for years where life was on the planet just filled with possibility and sparkle, even though there were definitely dark phases and things that were problematic. But we all, all of us, were brought into the world in the middle of darkness. Some of us. Were. And yet hope keeps coming up. It keeps coming up. And here we are in a period of hope. And that hope is suffused with the possibility of 
transcendence of greater forces of powers that beyond ourselves and our job as spiritual seekers, people trying to live in this world, is to open the door to hope and engage it when it happens and open the door to hope when it's not there and that it may come back again. To find a place in ourselves that is working with the idea of hope as a real thing in the world. So it's not just something that comes on occasion. It's something that actually, when it emerges and comes back over and over, teaches us and reminds us about this deep space that hope resides in. And that's what I want to talk about. Because what is that space? What is that space? It is in you. And it's a doorway to touching your deeper self. It's a doorway into the quote unquote spiritual dimension of your existence. Hope when it happens reminds you, it shows you that there is something operating inside you, even in darkness, that it can appear at any time. Yes, it can go away, but yes, it reappears. And that is your connection to this exquisite oneness, if you want to call it that singularity, which some people say, and I will buy into this, is the source of hope and love. And it's at the deepest crevice of your being. You arise, you are born out of, you live within this context of this enormity that is the core of hope and love and beauty and joy and bliss. Now, I don't want to disturb this idea because it's also the core of darkness and grief and loss and separation. And so trying to hold on to one is a, a totally human experience and understandable, but this singularity contains the totality of being, the totality. There is something going on there that in that space that all of us who have visited that space know it has its moments of transcendence and glory, and it has its moments of abandonment and loss. It's hard to talk about the creator as if you know anything or if you know something. But I have this ongoing experience as a person of touching the singularity and realizing that it is as alone as I am in the world. It understands aloneness. It understands what it means to have no other, to be all there is. And my sense of it is that it, the big capital I, it wants to be engaged in the company that is not out there without its creation. And so it gives birth to the other. Excuse me. It gives birth to us. And it gives birth to us so that it can see who and what it is. It manifests in the world and manifests us to witness the enormity of the miracle of what it is. That's what we do every day, every minute, every second of our life. Those of us who begin to witness the self as the incredible journey into knowing who and what we are or what I am, have a participatory role in existence that is beyond comprehension. It is beauty and amazement and joy and grief and compassion. It's everything going on simultaneously. And if you are connected to that journey, you are alive. If you are not connected to that journey, you are sleeping. You are here without awareness. And ignorance, which Buddha called one of the great sufferings, ignorance is not knowing that you are here witnessing the existence of mankind, of humankind, of animal kind, of fish kind, of everything that exists for the sake of the very self that wants to know who and what it is. It is glaring out of your eyes. It is breathing in your nose. It is hearing through your ears. And I think I may be saying this week after week now, but I cannot tell you how important it is to allow yourself 
to feel that, to experience that. And when you experience love and hope and beauty, you will go, <gasps> and you will touch it. When you go <gasps> all day long, you touch it all day long. Can you do it all day long? Yes. It's never not there. It's never not percolating in your life. The only thing that's a problem is in being born into the universe, you are given the right to think of yourself as separate and unique. And you are separate and unique, but you are also totally part of the collective. And what happened this week was the collective had an experience of hope. And the beauty was not just hope. But the beauty is that we all shared it. Well, I mean, all, you know what I mean. The, a larger group than just us had hope in our existence. And it was breathtakingly beautiful. And it's a reminder that we are, we are connected. We are one. We are the very source of all of this. And to know that sometimes you can breathe it in all day long. Sometimes it's just a touch. I will tell you, Today's class was very interesting. It was one of the deepest classes I have ever experienced. And every one of you, every one of you was a uh, recipient of a level of touch and connection and love and embrace that was deeper than anything I have ever experienced in teaching. I don't know why. I, you know, I can't speak to that, but I know that I was enraptured with this kindness that was being spread out to literally every single one of you and that you were re receiving it and you were deserving it and you are in a certain sense being anointed by this connection in yourself to yourself. It's an exquisite thing, exquisite. If you didn't feel it in class, don't judge it. Let me just tell you, you're already there. You're already connected. And if you keep this process going, what it will do is it will release you more and more into this exquisite sense of who you are. It will make you, um, it will make you, if you will, a greater and greater vessel of your true self. That's the journey, guys. That's what we're here to do. <clears throat> if you um, if you engage that, uh, whatever happens in this life, hope coming, hope disappearing, things rising, things falling, <clears throat> you're you're the author. You're the author. <clears throat> you are one with the author. Be amazed by it. Be enthralled by it. Be fearful of it. Be thankful for it, whatever it is that's going to happen at any given moment. <clears throat> Don't judge yourself. Don't try to think of yourself as lesser or separate from or cut off. Just witness the totality of you unfolding <clears throat> in this moment. And when there's moments of collective hope in the world, you are giving, being given a taste of something exquisite that doesn't happen regularly. It is really beautiful, and you have been there. You have received it. You have arrived at that place that we all shared together. So you can basically say thank you and move on to whatever's next. So all I can tell you is uh, thank you for being there. Thank you for being recipients of a quality of love that is unnameable. And, uh, and thank you for being open to getting it. It's uh, it's kind of extraordinary. It's just it's so it's so so filled with um, magic in a way. And I deeply appreciate. It. So, I guess that's my talk. Questions? Um, anybody? Bruce, uh, take one of you go first. I can't tell who's talking. Is there, uh, uh, I want. But okay, somebody Dale. else is too. <laughs> Dale, go for it. Thank you for, I don't know, thank you just seems so futile, but for expressing what the energy that flowed through you, what it was like for you, because I could hardly sit still. 
That's all I can say. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. Bruce, I have a question. Um, uh -huh. So uh, I'm like really noticing the value of hope and bringing a certain level of vitality and like regeneration, but especially when it comes to political, it's, you know, almost certain that the hope is in some sense delusional, you know, that the political thing is going to arrive where you're intending it. So there's like seeds of despair in the hope. I'm wondering, could you talk maybe about bringing it further down, how to go beyond that superficial level? There's the energy there, but how do you get out of the mental well, projection? I mean, you can go right into Rudy's core practice, which is ask for help to surrender, which is really central. It's in the heart chakra. You can go deeper to the navel chakra, but you take a breath inside and ask for help to surrender, which also means to accept whatever accept the joy and the feeling of of hope and the possibility of despair it's all there and if despair occurs to go accept that that we are we are these very volatile remarkable entities that go in all these different directions and every single one of us has that in us but the work is to really find a way of acknowledging the divine in the moment whatever that may be most of us use the work to become to, to get rid of stress and pain and suffering, which is not exactly what this is about. If you're trying to get free of your of your suffering, that's a journey of its own, you know. And good luck. If you're in the body, you're not going to get free of the suffering. It's just not going to happen. If you have society around you that is oppressive and difficult, you're not going to be free of suffering. But if you go into a very deep space in yourself and you find this connection, which is what this practice allows, you will feel a kind of hand on your heart saying, don't worry, don't worry, go through this. This is part of the human journey. This is part of what people go through. This is part of what I am. You need to connect. Need is a funny word, but it helps to connect to that space of thy will be done. It's really, really important in the deepest sense, and more so day by day as you go through this incredible journey. Thy will be done is sort of that. It's not about you. It's There's a larger will at work, and trust that journey. And unfortunately, it erupts at times into world wars and all the, and, and, and your own physical death. <laughs> you know, it's not, it ain't pretty on some level. But it is amazing and awesome. And if you go deeply enough, there is a level of um, acceptance in the process that's really powerful. And uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, Blanche and I discovered a cemetery near us, very close to this place called the Beekman Arms, which is where George Washington and others helped create American um, <laughs> America as we know it. It's and it's it's a half a mile, 45, a little bit more than a half a mile away. It's a cemetery. And it has a section that allows you to be buried in a shroud and to go beneath the surface of the earth, maybe just four feet, and feed the trees and the grass that grow around you. It is an unbelievably sweet place. And I and Blanche went together to look at this place because a friend of ours had buried his wife there and and I had heard about it and it was like, yes, this is my resting ground. And so Blanche and I went there with the uh, the uh, woman who ran the cemetery and we um, I'm going to show you a picture <laughs> and we uh, and we picked we picked the um, we picked the place. <laughs> We are going to spend the rest of our lives. Um, this is going to look weird, I think. <laughs> uh, here we go. Just if, if it comes up. This is this is where we are going to go and be beneath the surface of the earth and able able to become nutrients for whatever wants to grow. <clears throat> and, you know, I have a, this therapist that I go to for, you know, 30 years now, and just more of a friend almost, but really a therapist and really helpful. And I showed her the picture of that. And I told her how wonderful it was to be a nutrient. 
to become just <laughs> something that makes the world or whatever the things around me grow. And and I was describing some of the aloneness that I'm experiencing in my life and the sadness and the, the grief of leaving the world and all of that stuff. And she said, well, you're still here. Why don't you just be a nutrient here? And I thought, there you go. It's not even it's not even being a nutrient like a teacher. Just be a nutrient. Just make the world kind of a better place in some way. And how does that work? Well, I went to pick up Indian food last night at the restaurant we go to to get Indian food. And uh, the guy is the sourest guy I've ever seen in my life. The guy who takes you, that writes the writes it up and hands it over to you and everything. And and I said, I said to him, I said, you know, in five years of coming here, I've never seen you smile. And he went, and he just let out the biggest smile I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't know where the voice came from to say that, because I would not in most times ever do that. But I know that was a moment of being a nutrient. Mm -hmm. It was a moment of saying something that kind of needed to be said. It was not said from ju ju judgment or anger, just a gesture of something. And he got it. He got it. And that smile that I got back from him was so beautiful. You have no idea. And, he, and I know that it clicked. That's how you be a nutrient in the world. <clears throat> it's simple. It's very simple. You do it every day. You know, you can sit on a bench and just sit there quietly or feed the fish, which is what I do in Blanche, feeds the birds. And we are nutrients. That's what we are. And if we can do it when we're dead and continue to do that, that's the life cycle. That is beauty itself to me and joy. And I like the idea of completing this idea of what, what is the cycle of my life? I'm going to end up under the ground one way or the other, either in a casket protecting me from all the, you know, whatever's trying to get in to eat my body for, for 100 years or 200 years or on fire and blowing up and hurting the atmosphere and, the, and then you know, ashes blown to the wind. I, this is like, yeah, just go, go underground. But th what I'm trying to get at is I'm not trying to be fearful of the journey ahead. I am trying to be open and awake and alive to what the truth is of our human journey. And I have laid the groundwork now literally for this place. I've paid the, I paid for the plots, you know, Blanche's plot is 26 and her birthday is on the 26th. So it seemed in alignment. There was an, it started to rain while we were there. And that's always from Rudy's teaching a blessing. And then there was a tree that was kind of broken off a little bit and kind of not, not a little bit unpleasant. And I thought, oh, this doesn't look right. And then Rudy's words came back to me in the most profound way. It's, the words were, seek perfection in yourself, not in external objects. And that sold me. I'm going to lie in this cemetery with a tree that's got two limbs that don't look good and i'm going to be in a perfect perfect space and the universe said yes all i'm trying to get at is what is hope you're going to live forever no what is hope that you are going to influence the world in some massive way if you can make one person smile that's worth it that's the hope of being you know just be who you are and it is enough. And trust me, what, ex what I experienced today in this class teaching you guys was how unbelievably, exquisitely beautiful you, each of, each of you, I'm not talking one here, not one another. I'm talking every one of you is. You are beyond beautiful. And I could feel the singularity, the oneness, the source energy, whatever you want to call it, loving you in ways that, I can hardly, hardly express. I could feel it. I was the blessed, I was blessed with loving you. I could feel the love that you deserve, that is flowing toward you. It is beyond understanding. You, you do not have to earn it. You don't have to do anything, but it's nice if you could feel it. It would just make the ride easier. Open your heart and surrender. Surrender to the love. That's all you have to do. It's there. It's waiting for you. It's not judging you. It already embraces the person you are. Zach, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's a, it's a long, a very long response to the to that question, and probably makes nobody want to ask another one. Bruce, helpful. Bruce, can I yes. uh, ask you? Um, I just thought of it this from Zach's question, but 
is, um, do you ever think about, remember Rudy talked about being tested? Do you ever, do you ever think, is that relevant here? Is it? Yes. Um, because, you know, when you come into a new level or an opening, you, you know, be prepared because you're going to get tested. It, that's what I kind of remember. But well, you remember going to school? <laughs> yes. You remember having tests and what yeah. they were for? They're trying to see if you've learned. Are you ready to move to the next level? That's exactly what it's for. And we're tested all the time, all the time. You have to keep working and the universe has to see, are you doing it? If not, it has to put you back in third grade or whatever. You get tested until you show up and they say, okay, you've learned enough to function in whatever universe you find yourself in. So I believe very much in testing and, uh, and some of it's very dramatic. And, you know, I talk in my own book about the risk taking that, that for me was testing where, you know, I gave up, you know, a job at NBC News, a curator at the Whitney Museum, you know, I mean, I just kept, I did all these things to pursue my spiritual life. You know, crazy, crazy. The head of the museum said, are you crazy? <laughs> You're going to live in Indiana when you're curator of film at the Whitney Museum? I said, yeah, I'm going. And it was like a test, but it was like the universe saying, where is your, where's the importance? Where, where's the meaning in this life for you? And that was where it was. Was it the right choice to move to Indiana? Well, I met you, that, you know, Mary. I mean, that was kind of wonderful. And, you know, things happen through all of that. But, but we also had, you know, some co collective difficulties in that space. But it was a testing ground in a way. The test was to go there and then to pass the test of being there and move on to the next. And it never it hasn't stopped. You know, and every day I experience the loss of everything, which is a very strange experience after you know a half a century of spiritual sitting to lose everything which i do and then have to go okay <laughs> and then that's kind of the acceptance of the loss becomes in a way the the doorway to the next whatever but i will as i seem to do every week now i will go into the christ figure saying why have i been abandoned why have you abandoned me and then learning it's just about being a nutrient for the people outside not stop thinking about yourself. That appears to be the ultimate test. Can you turn your suffering into care for other people? That's the big one. That's the 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 the, the, the PhD, whatever you have to do mm -hmm. to get past that into the final stages. And that's what we're working on, every, every one of us. So the answer is yes. Um, there was somebody else, George. I just want to say that I think everybody like, doing this kind of work is living in hope. That's great. If you couldn't hear George, he said everyone doing this kind of work is living in hope. But you have to be careful that it's not hope for personal freedom or whatever. It's 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 something bigger. And if it's about the persona, you can do that and it does work, but it will be limited. It will, it will, it will that will be tested. And that's a problem because it we have to work beyond our own our own comfort zone. And that's really important. Wendy? Thanks, Bruce. Um, so I hear about the acceptance uh, that you're talking about, and that's very potent. And then Rudy talks about living above the agony. And then you were saying most people want to kind of transcend, you know, the suffering, get rid of, you said, but I take that as like Rudy saying transcend. So like, what's the difference of trying to, isn't, isn't living above it? No. Trans getting rid of it or in a sense for one's own experience or transcending accepting surrender to not away from you surrender to the what is and it is intense and i'm i don't you know <laughs> the 81 year old here keeps you know giving you all these lessons in aging you know it's hard and it's going to get hard er and it's going to get really hard <laughs> at the end and there is no transcendence of that there's like but I'm telling you from my own experience, my work spiritually is more intense now than it ever has been. And it's not trying to get away from, it's trying to go, yes, I will be done. It's really hard and it's really challenging and it really is a test. But being part of that is extraordinary. It's an extraordinarily brilliant aliveness that most of us often don't feel when we're going through the day-to-day -day life but the end of life 
everyone will feel. Everyone is going to be worried. This is about, I mean, the only hope that will remain at the very end is that you'll get past your pain. But not, you have to go through, you have to go through the human suffering of losing a body and all the things that entails. That's work. And if you're preparing for it now, you'll have an edge up. That's all I can tell you. But will you transcend it? That's, I, I think there's an illusion to that and, and a delusion. And I don't want to tell people not to do it because it motivates many people into their spiritual practice. But in the end, you are there suffering along with Christ on the cross. It is hard. And what you're going to need to do is think not just about your own pain and suffering, but people around you that you love, people around you that you can be there for, and see what that does to the equation. It is amazing. It is amazing to be part of a totality that involves love, joy, hope, suffering, despair, and grief, all in the same package. There we are, being human, being human. Hey, Bruce. Yes. Mark. Uh, Michelle, the idea of hope and the idea of this spiritual knowing that arises, you know, that spiritual knowing. And I was wondering for you, how does it change that hope? Is it not existent? Is it not needed? Huh. You know my question? Uh, yeah. I, I, let me tell you only personally that I was surprised by it this week. I haven't been walking around in a state of hope. I've been kind of walking around in a state of despair, you know, and trying to go, this is the world. This is where I live. This is what it's going to be. I didn't expect hope at all. But when I tasted it, I went, ooh. Wow, this is good. I like this. I knew immediately not to clutch it like it's going to be there forever, but I knew that it was a grace note that had impacted my life and opened up doors and shined a light on the world I live in, that something could happen of that nature that would give me this feeling of gratitude. That's all I can say. <laughs> I have, I mean, there, there. hope is, I think, the, the seed of renewal. The seed of where you what happens next, but it happens sometimes, and it dis, and it disappears many times. But it, it's the thing that can arise in the midst of the darkest moment and keep you going, just keep you going. It's a sensation of being touched by something that goes, "Don't worry, I got you." That's all I know. You know, it's really powerful. I mean, it's really powerful or sometimes subtle. But for me, this week, I have not experienced anything like that before. So that's why I'm sharing it. And I think a lot of people are you know, kind of agreeing. <laughs> they they got touched. And it's nice. We're all collectively touched. That doesn't happen every day. And by something wonderful, something sweet, kind, hopeful, you know, joyous, maybe. You know, I mean, it was. Whether it flowers in that way, I don't know. You know, anything can happen. We live in a dramatic universe but for the moment enjoy it bruce yes hearing your story of the indian food all i can think of is the soup nazi on seinfeld the soup nazi yeah. and i don't think anyone ever got him to smile yeah you don't you don't you can't get everyone to smile but occasionally it, it'll backfire but it's not for trying you know try i think we all can try make people try again you know, nutrients, not everything grows in a nutrient space, but it helps. It just helps. Okay, I think we should all go home or go back. We have you guys go back wherever you're going. Have a wonderful day. Uh, we'll try this again next week. And uh, if you can handle it, we'll be here. <laughs> <laughs>